Austin, turn to Daniel chapter 6. The book of Daniel in the Old Testament chapter 6 is where we'll be this morning. If you've been with us on Sunday mornings, the last few Sundays, we've looked at stories from the book of Daniel that had to do with character. And uh, I guess no, no series of Daniel would be complete unless you look at the lion's den. In fact, after church last Sunday morning, somebody came up to me and said, how long before we get to the lion den? I said, well, probably next Sunday. So here we are. We find ourselves with Daniel in the lion's den uh, this morning. All right, I'm in verse 1 of Daniel chapter 6. It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 satraps to be over the whole kingdom and over those three governors of whom Daniel was one, that the satraps might give account to them so that the king would suffer no loss. Then this Daniel distinguished himself above the governors and satraps because an excellent spirit was in him and the king gave thought to setting him over a whole realm. So the governors and the satraps sought to find some charge against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they could find no charge or fault because he was faithful nor because he was faithful nor was there any error or fault found in him and these men said we shall not find any charge against this Daniel unless we find it against him concerning the law of his god and so these governors and satraps thronged before the king and said thus to him king Darius live forever all the governors of the king kingdom the administrators and the satraps, the counselors, and advisors have consulted together to establish a royal statute and make a firm decree that whoever petitions any god or man for 30 days except you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. Now, O king, establish the decree and sign the writing so that it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians which does not alter. Therefore, King Darius signed the written decree. Now, when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went home and in his upper room, with his windows open toward Jerusalem, he knelt down on his knees three times that day and prayed and gave thanks before his God, as was his custom since early days. Then these men assembled and found Daniel praying and making supplication before his God, and they went before the king and spoke concerning the king's decree. Have you not signed a decree that every man who petitions any god or man within 30 days except you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions? The king answered and said, The thing is true according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which does not alter. So they answered and they said before the king that Daniel, that Daniel, who is one of the captives from Judah, does not show due regard for you, O king, or the decree that you have signed, but makes his petition three times a day. And the king, when he heard these words, was greatly displeased with himself and set his heart on Daniel to deliver him, and he labored till going down of the sun to deliver him. Then these men approached the king and said to the king, Know, O king, that it is the law of the... Mer- Mer- uh, can't talk. It is the law of the Medes and the Persians that no decree or statute which the king establishes may be changed. So the king gave the command and they brought Daniel and cast him into the den of lions. But the king spoke saying to Daniel, your God whom you serve continually, he will deliver you. Then a stone was brought and laid on the mouth of the den and the king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the signets of his lords that the purpose concerning Daniel might not be changed. Now the king went to his palace and spent the night fasting and no musicians were brought before him. Also his sleep went from him. Then the king arose very early in the morning and went in haste to the den of lions and when he came to the den he cried out with a lamenting voice to Daniel, The king spoke, saying to Daniel, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve, continually been able to deliver you from the lions? And Daniel said to the king, O king, live forever. 
My God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouth so that they have not hurt me because I was found innocent before him. And also, O king, I have done no wrong before you. Now the king was exceedingly glad for him and commanded that they should take Daniel up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den and no injury whatever was found on him because he believed in his God. And the king gave the command and they brought those men who had accused Daniel and they cast them into the den of lions, them, their children, and their wives, and the lions overpowered them and broke all their bones in pieces before they ever came to the bottom of the den. Then King Darius wrote, To all peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied to you. I'll make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom men must tremble and fear before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God and steadfast forever. His kingdom is the one which shall not be destroyed, and his dominion shall endure to the end. Uh, to the end, He delivers and rescues, and he works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. Who has delivered Daniel from the power of the lions? So this Daniel prospered in the reign of Darius and in the reign of Cyrus the Persian. Lions, prophets, and other dangerous things. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I, I come to you this morning. I thank you for the opportunity to preach your word today. God, I'm asking you to fill me with your Holy Spirit right now that I might speak your words with power, God. I pray, Lord, that you would touch every heart with the truth of your word. I pray your Holy Spirit would go to work on each of us, Lord, that you would convict us where we need convicting, that you would encourage us when we need encouraging, Lord, and that you would accomplish your purpose and your perfect will in each of us today, God. Lord, this is your time. It's your sermon. You gave it to me. I'm giving it back to you, Lord. Do with it what you will. And I pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Lions, prophets, and other dangerous things. So there's a new ruler in Babylon uh, from the last chapter that we looked at and the ruler is Darius the Mede so the kingdom of Babylon is now under the rule of the Medes and the Persians and Darius decides to set up his kingdom in a um, in a in a series of administrative districts and so he sets 120 satraps over these districts and then three governors over the satraps and he intends, because Daniel has excelled so in the kingdom, because God's hand is with him, Darius intends on setting Daniel over them all. So as you might imagine, this kind of rubs the governors and the satraps the wrong way. They don't like Daniel because they, they want to do it their way, and pride sort of gets in the way as it does sometimes. And so they plot to, to get Daniel. A plot to, to take down Daniel is, is born. You know, I don't know if you've ever heard a lion roar or not, but it's a terrifying thing. I... Um, so I'd seen lions on television and things like that, and, and I'd heard them roar on TV, and I thought, well, you know, it's just kind of an overgrown kitty cat, you know, no, no big deal. And then we went, one time the boys were little, they were just a little, you know, I don't know, four or five years old, and we, we were uh, living in southeast Texas, and we went to the Lufkin Zoo. Now, Lufkin Zoo's kind of, a little mom, it's not like the San Diego Zoo or something like that. It's like a little mom and pop zoo. Now, the, the city of Lufkin wouldn't like me saying that about their zoo, but it's just kind of a little mom and pop zoo. And because of that, you can get really close to the animals. And so, like, we're, we're making our little loop around the animal, where the animals are, and, like, we get to the lion cage, the lion captivity. And it's, it's basically just a little cage with a lion in there, the male lion, full grown. And it's about as 
Well, I got about as close to, to the bars of that cage as, as about from the end of this stage to that first pew. I mean, they had it where you, you couldn't, you wasn't close enough that you could stick your hand in the cage and pet the line, but pretty, pretty close. I mean, it, you were right there. And so we're making our way around. And Landon was, at that time, he was, you know, his attention span was very, very short. And so he'd be like, we'd be like, look, here's a lion. Uh-huh, what else? Look, here's a giraffe. Uh-huh, what else? Look, here's a, here's a zebra. Uh-huh, what else? And so we we're kind of making the round. But the lion caught my attention. And I'm standing there. And he's standing right at the edge, right, right at, at the at the bars of his cage, and I'm standing right there at the bars of my cage, at the, at, as far as I could get. And so there's, there's like all of about four foot between me and this lion. Big, tall, male lion. Big, full mane. Mus his shoulders and his legs were just a solid chunk of muscle. And I remember thinking, he is God's perfect specimen of a killing machine. And I thought, God has created this animal so every aspect about him was designed to strike terror and fear in his enemies and his prey. And I'm just standing there staring at him. And he's just standing there staring back at me as if to say, so what do you want? <laughs> And the boys are tugging on Lisa's, you know, shirt. Come on, let's go see something else. And I'm captivated by this line. So she says, well, I'm going to take them and go on. I said, okay, I'll be there. I'll catch up to you in just a minute. So they go on looking at whatever the next exhibit is. And I'm standing there, just staring at this line. And about that time, I guess he gets tired of the staring match. And he rears back his head and he lets loose a roar like I've never heard in my life. And, and I mean, the coldest chill ran down my back, and I jumped, and, and I thought, I'm, I'm going to die. And so I took off running, and I caught him there. Lisa and the boys are about three exhibits past, and I come running up to Lisa, and I, and, and I, and I grab a hold of her, and I said, and she said, what's wrong with you? I said, I almost died. She said, she said, how did you almost die? I said, the lion almost killed me. She said, how did the lion almost kill you if he was behind an iron cage? He, I, I said, because he almost scared me to death and I almost had a heart attack right there. But I'll tell you, when I read, ever since then, when I read scriptures about Jesus as the lion and God as the, roar, the roaring lion. I have a whole new understanding for it. Lions are terrifying. And the, the plot to get Daniel was this. First of all, they meet together, and the, the, the satraps and the governors, they meet together and they say, we can't get Daniel on any, any other law. We'll have to find fault We'll have to pick a fault based on his following his God's law. Now, wouldn't it be great if you could, if the only thing someone could find fault about you was, was the fact that you served God faithfully? As, as I look at this story, I see several dangerous things in this story. But you know what the least dangerous thing in the story is? The lions, believe it or not. As terrifying as lions are, the least dangerous thing in the whole story is the lion. So we're going to look this morning at three truths about character that we see from this story. Three truths about character that we see from this story. First I see is this. What you preach on the mountain better be what you practice in the valley. What you preach on the mountain better be what you practice in the valley. So the plan is... Of the, of the satraps and the governor is this. We want to catch Daniel on a matter of faith because you can't get him on anything else. And so they go to 
King Darius. And they say, Darius, all the governors and satraps, we've, we've had a meeting, you see, and this is what we've decided. Now, even that isn't true because one governor wasn't included, right? Daniel wasn't in the meeting. So not all the governors. Be, I hear that sometimes from people. Everybody, Brother Mark, everybody does this. Everybody's saying that. Well, no, not everybody. Just a little select group that you happen to be talking to at the time. So be careful when you start throwing out words like everybody. That's what, that's what the governors and satraps say. We've all met. Everybody has met. And we've all decided uh, that you're such a great king that we, you need to pass a law that anybody that worships any god uh, other than you for 30 days, let them be thrown in the lion's den. And we want you to write the law in such a way that it can't be changed. Now, why do you think they wanted it that way? Because surely, once the king got home and got to thinking about how silly this law was, he would have changed it. I mean, no matter what, no matter what he was thinking at the time, when he got home and he thought about it, he would think, this is a, a, a dumb law that I passed. And so they said, let's, let's, we want you to do it so it can't be changed. Uh, and so they were counting on a couple of things here. They were counting on the king's pride and impulsiveness. They played into his pride and the fact that he would just go ahead and say, well, of course I'm great. Everybody should recognize that. So let me go ahead and sign that into law. And they were, uh, they were counting on the fact that the king would honor man's law over God's law. Because most kings did. Uh, most kings still do, by the way. Honor man's law over God's law. Now, in the midst of this whole story is Daniel. And it would have been very easy for Daniel to drag up and quit at that time. I mean, I can just kind of see how the thought process might have played out for Daniel. God, I, I've tried to serve you my whole life, and what I've gotten out of it is trouble and heartache. And I, I, was, I was taken from my home as a teenager. I was, I was brought to some strange land. I was made a slave. My, uh, my hometown was destroyed. My, uh, the temple was, was leveled. I've tried to serve you, and now it's going to be against the law. I can't do it. I can't do it anymore. But not, not Daniel, you see. Daniel simply goes and does what Daniel does every day, which is pray to the Lord. And, and he not only chose to pray, but he chose to do it with the open window. You know, it, it might have, you know, you might look at that and say, well, man, why not just go ahead and pray and, and keep the windows closed and nobody would have to, nobody would have known. If Daniel had not opened the window, no one would know that Daniel was praying to God. And you know, that's exactly the point. And that's why he opened the window. He was making a statement. Daniel here didn't want to pray in private. He wanted to make a statement. This is who I am. You do what you have to do because I'm not backing down. Oh, that we might have men and women of God with the courage of Daniel to say, I'm not backing down. I'm going to serve the one true almighty God and you do what you have to do, but I'm not backing down. Daniel was able to stand for God because all this time he had walked with God. You, you, don't, you don't just overnight get this kind of courage and this kind of faith. It's something that grows and builds over time. Daniel was able to make this stand in chapter 6, because all his life he had been serving God. Don't wait until the, the, the test is upon you. Don't wait until the lions are roaring to decide to have faith or to figure out what you're going to do. Daniel had already decided a long time ago what he was going to do. What if they suddenly outlawed Christianity? What would you do? I'll tell you one thing, you can't wait until that time to figure it out. 
You, you have to be building and growing a faith and a courage that's based on that faith every day. That's what Daniel did. And I'll tell you one thing. What you talk about in church on Sunday better be the same faith you practice on Saturday night. And, and what you preach on the mountain better be what you practice in the valley because for Daniel it was. Second truth, I see this. If you open your mouth for God, He'll shut the mouth of your enemies. Open your mouth for God and He'll shut the mouth of your enemies. So in verse 11 and 12, the, uh, Daniel's enemies come to the king and they accuse Daniel. Tattletales. I mean, it's so childish really what they're doing. I mean, it's like tattletales. Hey king, didn't you, didn't you pass the law that says anybody that worships uh, a God besides you is going to get thrown in the lion den. Yep, that's the law. Well, guess what? Daniel done it. He, he's out there praying to God right now. Now, the king obviously didn't want to put Daniel to death. As you read the story, it becomes obvious that, da that the king's, this wasn't the king's idea. This was the governor's and the safe trap's idea. In verse 14, we're told that the king seeks sought to save Daniel. In verse 16, he says to Daniel, may your God save you. Notice he doesn't say, may my God save you, or even may our God save you, but may your God save you. See, Daniel was already a witness and a testimony to the king. The king didn't know the one true God, but he was about to see his power, and he had seen enough to know that this God that Daniel worshipped was capable of delivering him. Oh, that we might live our life in such a way that the world can look and say there's something special about the God you serve. And He is powerful. And then in verse 18, we're told that the king didn't eat or sleep or have his musicians come in uh, to, to entertain him. He was in a time of mourning. But he goes ahead anyway. This is, what, this is what I don't understand exactly. I, mean, I know that there's a, a law of the Medes and Persians that can't be changed, and I get, I get all that, and I understand the histor historical context of all that. But I also understand that he was the king. I mean, if you're the king in an in a empire like this, pretty much what you say goes. I mean, you pretty much can do what you want to do. So I, I'm not convinced that he couldn't have done something to stop it before Daniel gets thrown in the lion's den. But why didn't he? Because he was afraid of the crowd. Just very similar to the same reason that Pilate orders Jesus to be crucified. Not, Pilate didn't believe that Jesus was guilty of anything deserving of death. Pilate had the authority to release Jesus, but he feared the crowd. He feared the masses, and so he went along with them. I think that's kind of the way I see King Darius here. He didn't, he didn't have an axe to grind against Daniel, and he cert, I, I believe that he had the power to release him, but he feared the masses. He feared the crowds. What will people say? Same reason why we don't do what we're supposed to do. What would people say? People will get you in a whole lot of trouble. Quit listening to people. Start listening to the Lord. And so Daniel is thrown in the lion's den. And the, the king, it's sealed with a stone, and, and the king puts his signet ring on there, his insignia, as well as those of the, the, the nobles, the satraps. And so he says, may, may your God save you. And then we, we find the next morning that he goes to the, the lion's den. He says, Daniel, are you okay? And Daniel says, oh yeah, king, I'm fine. That's my very, very loose paraphrase of that. Oh, king, live forever. I'm fine. So Daniel was saved. He was saved because he trusted God. And he, he says... I was innocent before God and before you, O king. Because the angel had shut the lion's mouth. 
Um, so, Daniel was willing to die for his faith. And because he was willing to die for his faith, this time he didn't have to. Now, I think there's, there's an interesting aspect to the story of Daniel here. I don't believe, and this passage doesn't clearly say one way or the other, but I, I'm not convinced that Daniel knew for certain that God was going to deliver him from the lion's den. Um, I think that Daniel certainly believed that God could, and apparently King Darius believed that God could, but I'm not convinced that Daniel knew for certain that he would be delivered because that wasn't the point. Daniel didn't say, I'm going to go up here and open my window and pray because I know God's going to deliver me from the lion's den. No, instead, Daniel demonstrated real faith. He said, I'm going to pray to my God as I always pray to my God. I'm going to do the right thing. Whether or not God chooses to deliver me, I know He can. And, and if He chooses to deliver me, I'll praise Him. And if He chooses to let me get eaten by the lions, then I'll, I'll, be, I'll be a lion supper, but I'll be praising God all the time. That's real faith. The proper attitude is to do the right thing whether or not you get delivered. I think too many times we've been sold a bill of, good of goods about what true faith is. Oh, if you just have enough faith, you don't have to have cancer. If you just have enough faith, you don't have to be broke. You don't have to have family trouble. You don't, you don't have to lose your job. Oh, if you just had enough faith, you can get tr delivered from any trouble. That's not real faith. That's a genie in, the bod in a bottle. Who's the God in that? We make, we make ourselves out to be God, and Jesus becomes our servant. Jesus doesn't work for you. It's the other way around. Real faith says, I know my God can deliver me from the fiery furnace. I know God can deliver me from, uh, from the lion's den. I know God can find me a job. I know God can deliver me from cancer. I know uh, God can put my family together. But here's the thing. Even if he chooses not to, I'm still going to serve him and let the chips fall where they may. That's real faith. And what, a, what you find is when you open your mouth for God, God will shut the mouth of your enemy. The other truth I see is this. The lions that you sick on someone else may end up eating you. So be careful. The lions that you sick on someone else may end up eating you. Darius, when he learns that Daniel is still alive, he's greatly pleased. And he gives a testimony at the end of chapter 6 to all, uh, to all the peoples and all the nations. He says uh, that I, I make a decree in my whole kingdom that you're to worship the God of Daniel because he's the real deal, my very loose paraphrase there. He was convinced at this point. And Daniel's accusers are immediately thrown into the lion's den and they're immediately killed in fact before they hit the ground the lions it's very graphic it's uh, overpowered them broke all their bones and pieces before they ever came to the bottom of the den so these powerful lions now suddenly their mouths are open and and they crush Daniel's uh, opponents to death before they even hit the ground and their wives and their children are thrown in there too. You say, oh, that's horrible. That, that, that doesn't seem fair. No, it's not fair, but there's a great lesson here that our sin not only affects us, but it affects those around you. So if you think that you can commit sin and it not affect your wife, your family, your kids, your church, your friends, you're sadly mistaken. That's a lie of Satan. Our sin isn't just, I, I've had people say, well, I know I'm doing wrong, but I ain't hurting nobody but myself. That's a lie of the devil. Your sin hurts not just you, it hurts everybody 
around you. These people's sin, it costs not only their life, it costs the life of their, the life of their wife and kids as well. How much, so it's very similar, as I read this story, it's very similar to the story in the book of Esther where Haman, evil Haman, wants to hang the Jew Mordecai. And so he has this great big gallows built to hang Mordecai on him. And by the end of the book of Esther, it's not Mordecai that's swinging on the gallows, but Haman. So be careful, the, the gallows that you build for others, you may swing on yourself. The, 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 uh, the lines that you sick on others, you may, they may end up eating you. How much better it would have been just to leave Daniel alone? I mean, really, why, what was it hurting them? They let things like pride get in the way. They let things like selfish ambition get in the way. And they missed a very important fact, and that was that God was using Daniel. Daniel was God's man, and God was using Daniel, and they got in a very dangerous spot. Not the lion's den. They got in the middle of what God was trying to do with Daniel. And that's the most dangerous place you can be. When God has his hand on somebody and he's working and you try to get in the middle of what God is doing and stop it, that's the most dangerous place that you can be, not the lion's den. The, the lion's den is a tame place compared to that. When both God and the king, they, they both liked Daniel. Both God, God and the king were on Daniel's side. And when the God and the king like somebody, it's best just to leave them alone. It's generally not a good idea to mess with them. That seems to be the lesson here. God's purpose was going to be accomplished. Not Daniel's purpose, not King Darius's purpose, not the satrap's purpose. God's purpose was going to be accomplished. And it was going to, uh, and his purpose was that Daniel would prosper, and he did. And those that got in the way got fed to the lions. It's a hard story to read in a lot of ways. But it's true and it's necessary. When I was a kid, my grandma over her dining room table, she had this picture, this painting. It wasn't like, it was a, it was a copy of a painting. But it was a picture of Daniel in the lion's den. And Daniel looked like an old man. I'm not convinced he was an old man at that point, but he looked like an old man. And, and, and he's standing there with this, this serene glow on his face. And there's about a half a dozen lions. And they just, they're just resting. Kind of like that one right there. Kind of like, that, kind of like that picture right there. They're just resting. This looks like, doesn't, doesn't that lion look so tame that you could just go over and just scruff him on the head? And I, I wouldn't suggest doing that to a lion, by the way. But that's how it looked. And I realized, you know, that that picture always kind of confused me. I thought, lions are supposed to be dangerous, and these look so tame. And Daniel looked so unafraid. And then I, I, as I got older and, and looked at the story most, more closely, I realized something. I realized that the safest place in the whole kingdom is in the lion's den. The safest place for Daniel to be was in the lion's den because he got there by serving God. The most dangerous place in the whole kingdom was to be the one that was messing with God's man. That was the most dangerous spot to be. And it cost these satraps and governors their life and the lives of their families. There's a lot of dangerous things in this story. A lot of things to watch out for. The least of which is the lion. You know, I, I can't help but look at this story and think of how Jesus is described as the Lion of Judah. But he's not a, he's not a tame lion. There's a, there's a scene in the, uh, the Chronicles of Narnia where uh, Lucy says about Aslan the lion, who's the Christ figure, he's not a tame lion. And whoever she's talking to, he says, no, no, he's not a tame lion, but he is good. Jesus is the, the lion that roars. 
but he's also the lamb. God didn't deliver him from his enemies. Instead, this lion who became the lamb willingly gave his life. Not to be rescued, but to rescue you and me. To pay the debt for our sin. So that our enemies would not prevail against us. Our great enemy, the accuser, Satan, would have nothing left to accuse us over because our sin debt would be paid for through the sacrifice of the lion who became a lamb, Jesus Christ. And by faith, we have access not just to be citizens of the kingdom, but to be children of the king through what Jesus, this lion who became a lamb, has done. In just a moment, we're going to sing an invitation hymn. It will be God's invitation to you. I wonder how many today might say, you know, I need Jesus as my Savior. I need to know personally this one who gave his life for me. And so I, I won't just say, well, you know, I, Brother Mark, you're God, or Trey, you're God. But I can say, this is my God. I know Jesus personally. What I want you to do when we, when we begin this singing in just a minute, I want you to step out from where you are and come. Let me lead you in a prayer of faith, trusting Jesus as your Savior and Lord. And then you can know this lion who became a lamb, Jesus Christ, personally. You may say, I know Jesus as my Savior, but I've never made that public. I've never been baptized. I encourage you to make that decision today. Or maybe the Lord is laying on your heart to join this church and and serve side by side with your, your church family here at Memorial Heights. Maybe the Lord's just leading you to come and pray. Pray for yourself. Pray for those around you. Pray for your family. Pray that you might have the kind of courage that Daniel had to live your life for, for God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I, I come to you right now. I thank you, God, for your word and the chance to preach it today. I pray, God, as we come to this time of invitation and decision, Lord, that you might touch our hearts, that you would, God, stir us, lead us to the decisions you'd have us to make. For we pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.